Welcome to the Magic Hour, a safe haven for lost stories and curious folk. On today's episode, we are joined by Laura Vendris, Pixie's aunt, and we'll be unearthing more content on menopause and the mythic journey we travel through as we age. Because we're talking about health, uh, we need to remind ourselves that normal only describes what a large group of people have experienced. It does not define all experiences. Each one of us moves through transitions uniquely. Please seek out your own medical health team to support you in your best interests. Our goal is to demystify things that are often left in the dark. But we all have our own stories, hence why we have the lovely and kind Laura here today. Yay! Laura, um, welcome. Thank we would you. love for you to... We would love for you to introduce yourself, and then we'll ask you a few questions about your personal story. Well, my name is um, Laura Vendries, and I am 67 years old, and I have two children who are adults, and I live alone in Niagara Falls, New York, and Mm -hmm. I... I'm a nurse, been a nurse for 47 years, and I have been a teacher of high school students for, this is my sixth year. So I am a yoga teacher, been doing that for about 20 years, and well, that's all I know. How many siblings do you have? Like, I don't know. I have... (laughs) I have six, I have three brothers and three sisters. And one sister is deceased. The rest of us are still kicking. My mother, our mother is 99 Mm -hmm. years old and quite an interesting individual. Yes, she is. But that's a story for another day. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, thanks for telling us that little, (laughs) thanks for telling us that little um, intro about yourself. So, Let's like jump right in. So what was your experience of menopause like in general when you think back to that time? In general, I was unaware of exactly when it started. And the only reason I knew it ended was because I didn't get my period anymore. So it wasn't something that jumped out at me and I started sweating. And I watch people do that in yoga class. They're sitting there and all of a sudden they turn Mm. red and they start sweating. So I know what that looks like from the outside, but I don't know what that feels like from the inside. Uh, For me, um, I think I was not so aware of my body as perhaps I might be now. And Mm. so I may have missed things as they went along because I was really good at ignoring what my body was telling me. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Looking back at that situation that you weren't super aware, um, why do you think that is? Why do you think a lot of times, I don't think you're the only person like that. Like, why Why do you think we do that? Why do you think you did that? Or why you, you were like that in that time? Yeah, I think that I was like that in every time. And okay. I think that it's just a lack of connection with myself. Um, mm-hmm. a lack of using to be very stoic, raised to be very stoic or um, so I wasn't tuned in or thought it was important enough to pay attention to that part of myself. That's my guess. Um, mm-hmm. Even now, like occasionally I'll get a little bit of warmth, but nobody would ever know. And it's not like dramatic and it's not like anything I think about because most of the time I'm freezing. So even now, I have to remind myself to pay attention. It's nothing new. Yeah. I think about how um, this phrase has been coming up again and again for me that um, it's a different context, but we are not disabled, but the world or the environment disables us. So this sense of what is asked of us 
in you know a structured either it's it's you know the physical place that we exist in or um, societally how we are supposed to behave um, it asks of us things that disconnect us from ourselves or um, ask us to use to move through things in a way that isn't potentially very authentic I wonder how I much think when I hear that whoops I I think when I hear that and I had a little trouble hearing at the end um, I think it's Society certainly does influence us, but in the end, we're responsible for our own selves. And so mm. my not being able or aware enough to notice was my way of making my way through my world at that time. And I teach high school students right now. And those high school students basically... I got my period. I think I'll be out for a week. What? You know, so I'm the other end of it. I'm the society mm. part. And I'm saying, really? You got to make your way through this because every single month you can't be out from somewhere for a week from your job because you have cramps, you know? And so I find myself being mm. that society part that goes, I understand, but maybe we can think of a different way to handle this or to move through this. For instance, when you're, when you're delivering a baby, you have had a baby, right? Rudo? Is that true? Yeah. Yes. So, and Jesse yes. did not, but when you're going through labor and delivery, if I push hard against those correct contractions, they get much worse. If I can breathe through them and ride with them on a wave, I'm going to make, I'm going to be in a different place. So some of it is even mm. education in general about how we handle the difficulties that come our way, both physical and otherwise. Yes. I love that because it asks us to just relate to things differently. It's not that one way was better or one way is better. It's that um, we're being called into having more compassionate conversations and staying curious about what can be solved. And the possibilities of looking at things from more than one perspective, not just the one mm. we were raised with, but the ones that maybe other people can share. So this sharing from women sharing with women in particular, in this case, um, seems like it might be really helpful. Um, yeah, I think about how yeah. your your generation would have handled the, your relation to pain and how the younger generation's relation to pain might be really different. And, you know, pleasure and pain. I think we are discovering how different these these eras are. Yeah. And so the, it's and interesting the that your high school that students I'm want to. Are yeah, continue. The the high school students are are 16 through 17 most of them. And that's a bunch of years younger than you guys. And and so although I think it's an individual yeah. thing and it's definitely society cushions that, there's also an individual personal familial um way of reasons why we express or ignore things the way we do. Um, yeah. And it's all very personal and unique to each person. I love the idea of stories because stories and storytelling seem to be really, really, really important. Um, and that's what makes when someone tells me something interesting because it's their own reflection and their own story and they're not trying to superimpose it on everybody else um, it feels mm -hmm. when I tell a story or I tell something about my immediate story or oh, I'm having drama in my brain or whatever's going on then 
and I'm talking to a person who is immediately telling their story or trying to correct mine, uh, mm. I will be really troubled because it feels very uh, kind of like I don't need a teacher. I can tell you what I feel. Um, and so I really like it when people are able to listen and I am able to listen to others without feeling like I have to encourage them to become this thing or another or to feel this thing or another. If, for instance, if I approach somebody and I say, golly, I'm having a really crappy day, I just can't believe it. And they say to me, oh, just keep a positive approach. And for Oof. me, I don't like that. Yeah, it feels uncomfortable. It feels dismissive. And I have learned to go to try to have myself go through what I feel rather than around it. Because when I've mm. gone around mm. it my whole life, I never grew because I didn't go through it. So that for me becomes mm -hmm. important. That was beautifully said. I'm thinking. And I was just going to ask you, what do you wish you had kind of had then? So you just answered that question. I, yeah, I will say to you too, that I didn't get my period till I was 18. And so I was much older than everybody else. And I think some of that was probably physical and some of that was probably psychological. But again, I just project, I don't know. Um, mm. I, I think that in that case, having such a late onset of puberty, or at least any late awareness of it, really kept me disconnected from my whole sexual self. And from my whole mm -hmm. um, growing self in that regard. So I think I missed a lot of life. And I, as I watch mm -hmm. these kids who I'm teaching, I find that I found myself wistful thinking like, you know, I wish I had allowed myself to go through puberty the way it looks like everyone else is, except for that it is a whole lot of drama. And um, I wonder if all of that late arrival was to do with me suppressing things, um, ignoring things, or a little bit of, of both. Interesting. Mm -hmm. When did you discover yoga? I, I started to, I, from Lilius Yoga and You, who was on TV when my children were little, so I had to be in my 30s. And I loved it because it was like, you didn't have to compete with anybody. You just lay down the ground and you put your feet. I was like, I'm really, and then I'm very flexible. And so it was like, oh, I can do this. And I loved it. And um, I don't know where I came across somebody that was teaching yoga in Buffalo. And from the yoga, um, not Yoga International, from the Himalayan Institute. And they had a program where I could take it for a couple of years. And then I ended up taking it just to learn about it more and to understand it more. But I ended up teaching it. So I've been teaching it ever since. I still teach it now. And it's it's been really helpful because it forces, for me, it helps me slow down. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to slow down for mm -hmm. me. I can't stop my brain, so nobody think I'm a great meditator because it's not true. Um, <laughs> must run in the must run in the family because I'm the same way. We know this. Well, we also know that the brain itself is job is to think, right? So if the brain job is to think, then that's what it does. And so rather than fighting that, I think we have to kind of accept that and kind of live with it. Um, Sometimes it seems to me like I'll go through periods of time where I would be meditating every day. I'm that girl. I'm on it. I'm doing it. And then I go through, where'd that go? <laughs> oh, I, I guess, can I make time? No more. And I, yeah, no more. And I think um, even accepting that becomes important and, and trusting that meditation can be something as simple as walking mindfully or one of my goals, this is one of my goals, is in my life is to honor, notice, 
and then take a moment to absorb the sacred that's in each day. Um, the story that I remember is from um, a doctor who was raised, she was raised basically sort of agnostic, but her grandfather until she was four was um, a, a, Jew, a Jewish um person who was very he was like a the part of that religion that is sort of very very spiritual and he would tell her stories and one of the stories he told her was how the gold or the goodness um rained down on all the earth and all these little pieces rained down and were embedded in the earth and within people and that it was our job to uncover this reflection of the universe that was in every single person and every single thing. Mm. And so at some point in her little talking about her grandfather, she mentions the fact that, you know, this, there is sacredness in every person and there is sacredness in every thing. And uncovering that, taking a moment to acknowledge that and to recognize it. To me, that's a form of meditation. Um, that is yeah. something I aspire to do. It gives me a different outlook on life. You How know, does that I can relate? Be... Go oh, ahead. Sorry. How does that relate to um, the way that you've been nursing and also the way that you experience your own um, journey as a woman? And then seeing other women's journey in nursing. Yeah. How does that inform both the way that you care for women in your, in your nursing space, but also how has that informed how you relate to your own journey? I think it's been a journey and I'm still arriving, but I think one of the things that I have found to be most satisfying in my nursing is being let into people's private circles. Mm. So they share with you and you're in a part of them when they're in pain and when they're miserable and when they're happy and when they're just scared. And so I think that compassion um, is huge and recognizing that these hands, this body in this room at this time, his job is to serve. And when I serve the other, because they're not really the other. We're really, in my opinion, we're really all one. When I serve the other, I serve myself. And accepting people without judgment is so much easier when they're not your family. You know, I get a real, get a real attitude, right? Um, with mm -hmm. the family, there's always the buttons that are embedded within us that we push. And when I am out there working with other people, it's much more easy for me to be to honor honor where they are in this moment without judging them mm. and to provide compassionate care that is what i hope have i always done that sure not but do i try yeah is that what i teach yeah that's what i want taking care of me if i need help what helps you get to the best place to do to be as near to that aspiration as possible a practice mm. practicing it when it's easier and then when it becomes a habit then it becomes more likely to happen you know to be able to notice the sacred in the midst of the secular to notice the blessing the grace in the midst of this world um and it gives me great hope when people can do that or if i can do that then i feel more hopeful i will tell you i do meet with my friend every sunday and we do do poetry and we did something today i found two i ran across two poems one that was very hopeful for me and it 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 was just different. It, it's called Stars and Dandelions. I'm not even sure who it is, written by 
Um, we'll find it. And it, it goes it goes like this. Deep in the blue sky, like pebbles at the bottom of the sea, lie the stars unseen in the daylight until night comes. You can't see them, but they are there. Unseen things are still there. The withered, seedless dandelions hidden in the cracks of the roof tile wait silently for spring, their strong roots unseen. You can't see them, but they are there. Unseen things are still there. A simple words, but speak yes when I cannot see the whole picture, which I never can, right? How mm. would I know? Mm. There is still hope because things are really happening there. Mm -hmm. um, when I, I jumped into another, we have had terribly gray days here where I live. This is the time of year when it's all gray. <laughs> so at the same time, I found another poem which gave me some direction. Ooh. And I can't, this one's called Gray. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's written by Phil Ellsworth. Dawn breaks, another cloudy day with mist and fog, all shades of gray. My inner weather is the same, inside or outside, either way, it's just a melancholy day. Which weather is to blame? I'll play myself a happy air to drive the mist and fog away and make a melancholy day, if not sunny, just as fair. <laughs> <laughs> Both of so those we didn't... are just about um, unseen stories. That's right. I love it. And I... Both of them, the first one gives me hope. The second one holds me responsible. Mm. Mm. Right? Like, I'm looking at the sky today and I'm going, okay, there's more than one shade of gray out there. And then the sun came <laughs> through. I almost want to take a picture of it and go to my girlfriend. There it is. And from her perspective, her reflection on this poem was, you know, there's always the sun up behind the clouds. My reflection was, because I was reading it and I had read it a couple of times, was, is my melancholy related to how I am inside of me or what's out there? And in the end, Am I not responsible by, could I not sing some music, make some music, bring something into my life that would um, change my melancholy attitude? <laughs> uh, I'm having, this is so cool. And I'm having some thoughts about, I find it very interesting and beautiful that we started talking about your initial experience with your body changing and you not being aware and the conversation has shifted to uh, the importance of awareness in general and finding the important moments in everything painful or with pain or pleasure and like how that changes our lives. And it's kind of beautiful thinking about it's it's like it's sad, you know, that and I, you know, we all have these stories that you maybe missed out on these things because you weren't present at the time. But now, you know, and you can transmit that to other people in not just like the experience of menopause or your body changing or an illness or what's going on with grandma right now and you know where she's at in her life like um I don't know there's this beautiful sense of presence in this conversation that I think is key to experiencing our bodies and like it is our responsibility but also I think it is society's responsibility to make allow us to make space for that. And I think that's always the challenge, isn't it? Like you even said you were playing society in the classroom. I do too when I teach. Um, to like allow for the space to happen so we can do what those poems were saying. And I think we're working towards that, like working towards that. But thank, thank you for that beautiful, like kind of full circle vision I was getting as I was listening. It was really cool. Thank you. I like that reflection. And I think one of the things that a friend of mine is doing right now is starting temple, a feminine temple. And I've heard this now several times from several different people. And so I've gone to temple with her and it's a woman's temple. And it's all about women learning to acknowledge themselves um, and grow and be 
their best selves, which is a kind of a trite phase. But I think we need to make space for ourselves. And mm-hmm. to me, like if I could do something right now, it would be to have people come into my home, particularly women, every Sunday and do some reflecting, force myself, oh, um, read some poetry, find gratitude. Um, everybody doesn't have to be, ritual is wonderful. Mm. Ritual to me is wonderful. And so ritual, like the things I learned in my Catholic upbringing, candy, candles, being present, mm-hmm. swarms of people coming to the front of the church to receive one body, to become one body, you know, um, incense, like colors, beauty, yeah. beauty, setting up a beautiful space mindfully, um, you know, rocks, flowers, you know, all of these things can help us to move, to be aware of, closer to our, ah, yes, to ourselves. Mm. Um, and to you know, have an awareness and not feel badly about our awareness about ourselves. Mm. Um, and I suppose, I know that society has a role, but nobody's going to give us a role. We have to take it. We have to take the space. We have to mm. take up yeah. space. Yeah. If we're used to being invisible, I'm used to being invisible my whole life. Yep. And when you can, you have to be so invisible that nobody can touch you is how I think I understood it. And I could be in a room and nobody would know I was there. And now I'm in front of a classroom and they all think I'm a great extrovert, but I'm not. I'm still the same person. I'm just making a different choice. And I'm trusting my intuition as I teach trusting that when we sit still in the beginning of class for two minutes, wherever we are, that um, something's going to come to mind and I'm going to say it. Mm. And maybe it'll help somebody. And maybe it won't. Or maybe it'll help them much later um, at a time when they're not aware. You've just Um, defined what it's like to be a teacher. (laughs) Yep. I am nodding emphatically. (laughs) Like that? (laughs) It's just Um, like, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a real... So, as far as menopause, it's part of a bigger picture. Yeah. You, You know, it's just one small piece of a whole life learned of how I live it, how I exist in my space and how I reflect on myself. It's good. Woo. I really needed to hear that. (laughs) I did too. I did too. I've been having a lot of thoughts about death lately. Um, Like not just like actual dying, but like the death of cycles, which menopause is. It's like the, the, you know, it's like the shift to another, um, time period in your life it's new you know something has definitely has ended and then something has begun and um feeling a lot of like I've been exploring death in its many forms and wanting to do a little bit of death meditation work kind of like starting to kind of explore engaging with it so I'm not so afraid of it because it's just part of life Uh, just like menopause is a part of life and so everything you're saying is um beautiful because it's I think it's what we all need to hear. All these things are, like you said, it's important to be in the pain or in the discomfort because that's part of it too. If we just ignore that, we miss out on all of these things we need to know and need to understand. And we kind of avoid death. And that's probably why we avoid talking about things like menopause because it's like, oh, awkward, kind of scary, kind of this like halfway point in our lives. And um, there's a lot of wisdom here is what what I'm saying. I think that not one of us has the whole picture, but there's definitely yeah. a lot of evidence that we move through death into another side of our life. Yeah. So it's not like death is the end. It's a doorway. Um, 
there is a woman who I listen to a podcast, I cannot remember her name, but she accompanies people who are dying. She was an ICU nurse and she, she was, a lot of people were on machines and she started to wonder to keep them alive. She started to wonder if we were interfering in their ability to move from one place to the next. Mm. And she investigated that. And there was a school, I think down somewhere down in Virginia, cannot remember where it is. I don't have the names of everything right now, but this was a, a group of people or, or a spiritual community or somebody that actually taught people how to accompany people through the door of death into this next space. Yeah. And one of the things she spoke about was that when on the other side, there were people who they knew and people who they didn't knew, all of whom were supporting them and lifting them up. So I love the idea that we don't travel alone, that we are supported and lifted up when I feel so alone. If I can remember that peace, maybe it'll seep its way into how I feel. Maybe not, but maybe. And I love this idea. It's like she offered a hand to these people and she actually learned this. Oh, it was, um, it's an Irish, a Celtic spirituality, um, which is what they were doing. And, and it's just this lovely, Anam Karam was the name of it. And there's a lot of um, Irish poets and John Irish o John O'Donoghue, people. right? John O'Donoghue. Yeah, Donahue, me, who is who has died? Yeah, yeah. Me and Rudo love him too. That book is like my Bible. Yeah, it's wonderful and it is really helpful. I think. Yeah, it's also one of those books where you can walk up to it, open, open anywhere, and receive. Yep, exactly what you need to hear. I love that. And there's and a quote that I, I'll read it in a second. But yeah, what is it? Um, I'll read it. Well, it, it just seems perfect for what we're talking about right now um, about death. And again, I'm not just talking about physically dying and passing on, although that's part of it, but um, that process that fem women go through. Um, and so the quote was, at her first bleeding, a woman meets her power. During her bleeding years, she practices it. At menopause, she becomes it. And the person who said that was Lucy H. H. Pierce. Um, and I sent it to Rudo the other day and she was like, oh, we need to include that quote. And I think it's relevant. It's like, there's a time and a place for every phase and they're all important, not just one of them. And I think just by telling these stories, we're kind of shifting that narrative to acknowledging those different, really amazing phases. And calling them all amazing. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes we sometimes we get caught. I think in the first eighteen years of our life, so much happens, and we're so impressionable, yeah. and we kind of use that to define ourselves. And it it's so clear. You go, I remember that. And then there's periods of time, at least in my life, where there's like I don't remember much of anything. Mm -hmm. You know, some people may yeah. not may not remember much when they're young. I find I I. There's a whole space in the middle of my life where I don't remember a lot. Me and too. I hope you too. And I hope that by acknowledging and practicing, paying attention, instead of rolling through things so fast, whether we remember them or not, we can learn and grow. And maybe feel less fearful, which immobilizes us. Um, the last line of a prayer of sorts that I say, which is actually a poem, um, says, may I have the courage, may I have the courage to live the life that I would love. And to postpone my dreams no longer, but to do what I came here for and waste my time on fear no more. I believe that's John O'Donohue, a last line of one of his poems, one of his blessings. And 
the fear does immobilize me. Um, so I ask you, what is the opposite in your mind of fear? Me. Either one of you. Both of us. The huh? opposite of fear for me mm -hmm. would be... Oh. I think presence... Like being here now would be the opposite of fear. Mine is knowing. Me. Knowing. And I suppose that my word would be trust and hope. Mm. Because, again, I think about the fact that I can say, this is terrible. It's awful. The whole situation is bad. Why is this happening? Can't believe it. And yet... I don't really know what's bigger than that. There's a painting, a tapestry. There's something that's going on that I am not privy to because I am not the all-knowing universe. So I am trusting that as those dandelion seeds and roots grow stronger, so too, and dandelions continue to come up, so too, I can trust that there is life after death. There is gentleness after pain and sorrow. You know, that there is something that emerges afterward. Um, and after the baby is born, you forget the pain, so to speak, until it happens again. And um, at the end of a cycle, if you're going through your menstrual cycle, there's an end to that. And then there's a rhythm and a circle, just like the circulatory system in our body, right? Yeah. So saying these things and honestly i have to say poetry for me comes in at things tangentially it comes into things from the side and it allows me allows each of us to have different words to describe the opposite of fear mm. and because and i listen to people who are poets and they talk about poetry and it's goes right into the brain but for me poetry has got to go through my heart and mm. so I watch for my immediate reaction. Now, that's another way of becoming more aware of myself is seeing which one appeals to me and which one doesn't and being okay going, I like this one. And I, I remember practicing um, at a time in my life when I it was a very difficult time. And I remember practicing trying to figure out what I liked and what I didn't. So I would walk around the house and I'd go, ah, I like that color. I don't like that. <laughs> I like that word. Don't like that. And that was my practicing, right? So that I could learn to to notice what I was seeing, feeling, and thinking and to say it. And I think that's helped. Um, some people do it naturally. For me, it was a lot of work. Yeah, I've had to do the same. And uh, I teach collage in school and I do collage exactly for that reason. Collage for me is a way for, where I'm very, I let myself be very picky. And I'm like, only pick what you really like. And it's interesting to see what what I choose and what I throw to the side. And it's very revealing. And I do that with my students to start the year out to get everyone starting to go inwards a little bit. That's so cool. So, yeah, it's really important. Yeah. But it took me I a long time because I hear you talking and I, you know, I think we know this. We've shared this before, but we have it sounds like we have relatively similar um, speedy minds. Um, that <laughs> so can be cute. hard to rein in at times. Yeah. So. I think it's a family trait. It's also it genetic. <laughs> it's yeah. genetic. It is. Yeah. And it's hard to compare. Like some yeah. people just on the outside, they look like they're so calm and they speak slowly. And I want to be that girl one day. Um, <laughs> but I'm not quite there. And I probably never will be because that may not be who I am. But to be honest, just to be clear, to me, you are that, um, you know, this might be a good story and I think it's important. It's very short, but I remember when I was in college, there was this small period of time where I was going on medication for severe OCD and I stayed with you and I have this memory. I don't think I've ever told you this, yeah. but I was, I was starting this medication. It was very scary and I did not like it. Um, it didn't end up helping me, but I tried it and, um, you took me to Wegmans. 
and you were kind of going through with me how you went through a day and you were like after work when I'm hungry I get I get like a power bar to hold me over till dinner and like and like we like went shopping and we went back to your house and um you were like take your pill and like I took my pill and you were really calm and then you took me to a yoga class and by the end of that and I was drawing a lot of I was making I was drawing mandalas in my sketchbook and I I can't believe I never actually thanked you for that weekend because I think you might have mm-hmm. helped me. Mm-hmm. I think you did. Not I think. I know that you actually were a grounding force because you knew what I was going through on some level and you were able to talk me through that time. And I got through it and I figured out my own path. But I always, whenever I go food shopping, I always think maybe you need a power bar so you don't get <laughs> – so you don't get a little – like because what if I don't eat? I get – I, my anxiety amps up and it's really bad. So I need to make sure I have something in my stomach because I'm very um, airy and I need to be grounded. And that was something you taught me. So, and I think I'm starting to be able to do that now. I'm getting better at that now as I'm hitting 40. And I think that like, I'm starting to feel that power of, oh, I think I'm master. I'm not going to say I am a master because I never will be. So what I'm trying to say is you actually are more strong and grounded than you think you are because I look up to you in terms of handling scary things. I know that if I call you with something I'm afraid of, you won't like act like it's not scary, but you don't freak out either. And you kind of talk me through it and you give me an ability to process the information. So you've been a great influence. And I think that's cool because that's healing generational trauma too. Wouldn't you say? Mm. Yeah. Oh, Am I making you cry? Sorry. (laughs) Oh, I just yeah, think that's, that's also a family trait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful that you've you've moved through this place and you've found some mm-hmm. tools that you can use to help you. And you're yeah. aware now when you're it's something simple like I'm aware that when I'm hungry, I'm crabby. Yeah, I remember when I stopped getting my period. I remember being startled. Oh my god! I thought there was something wrong with me. Now I know what was going on. The hormones were going like this, up and down and up and down. And I I was startled because I wasn't aware how sadness, depression, um, and discomfort and how I faced the world were so affected by my hormones. Yeah. And all of a sudden they weren't there. And I'm like, oh, I like this. This is pretty easy. I'm just going like this. It's not that everything is easy, but there's definitely a difference when I stopped having my period and I stopped having the hormones being dumped into my system. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I wonder, though, because as me and Ruto being a different generation, now people my age that all my friends, we all very clearly state, oh, my hormones are doing this and we'll talk each other through. I think part of this is I mean, it's all real, but I think we are more present now with our hormonal shifts and we know to differentiate between, oh, this is amping up my feeling. Let me not have that conversation. We'll say, don't have that conversation with that boyfriend or girlfriend until you <laughs> sleep on it. You know, we'll, we'll do that a lot or just with anyone. We'll be like, don't talk to that person until tomorrow. And I think that that's a cool shift societally as taking charge because I think our generation is now saying, hey, remember this happens. Let's just be careful. And I think I, I see, at least in my friend group, that I think that we are shifting that. and I But that's because of your generation moving. You know, it's a beautiful, like, evolution that's happening here. Yeah. And that's why this yeah. conversation is so important. And yeah. the demystification of it, that we are yeah influenced by cycles that we can relate to better and, and know better. And they're internal and external. Um, but it's all, like, demystifying it. And and the demystification is important because women have been demonized for it and mocked for it and not given the space and time to feel like by whose partner or who's in a relationship where you've been kind of made fun of. And it's like, well, this is actually part of being alive. How do we work with it with presence and empathy and understand why it's happening rather than just judging it without knowledge? And I think that word demystification is key here, I think. And um, self-compassion too, Jess. And self-compassion, yeah. Because we are really hard on ourselves and on other people sometimes. We're just really mm-hmm. hard. And so I love yeah. that. I think putting words on things um, 
You know, I think of Maya Angelou, who didn't speak all that time after she was raped and thought she killed this guy because she spoke, then stopped speaking. I think the speaking becomes really important in demystifying anything. It's a beginning. It's a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it doesn't need to be spoken in words. It can be spoken in art, spoken in writing. Um, but it does help to have other people hear you and to say, oh, yeah, that kind of happens. Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. Um, I'm feeling like this is winding down to a beautiful place. And I'm curious, Laura, if there's anything else that's coming to you that you feel like is important. Um, sleep. Mm. <laughs> um, the first line of that what? poem that I read, the last line, the first line is, bless the night that nourished my heart to set the ghosts of longing free into the flow and figure of dreams that goes to harvest from my heart, bread for the hunger that no one sees. So that's John O'Donohue again, that's the very first verse of this six line, six um, verse poem. And to me, sleeping, which is so disrupted by hormones and not hormones, just pointing it out, um, is important because I think it allows us to process the things that we bump into in the course of our days. And Yet again, there needs to be a lot of compassion and acceptance when it doesn't happen. And you wake up, there you are, right? In the middle of the night. And um, yet I think it's important, the rest. Um, so I guess I would say that um, accepting it when it's not happening, but really allowing it to happen when it can because it will help us as women, as people, um, learn what we long for and unravel things a little bit better. Mm. You've definitely been poetry for us today. Yeah, this is, <laughs> I needed this very much. Yeah. I'm so happy. I, I, I too, like I had, I had no idea where I was going today, and, and this is great to be able to talk to you guys and um, say my own truth and a little bit of my own story. So thank you. Yeah, this is really a gift to any other anyone else who listens to it, too. So I hope. I yeah. hope. Rudo, anything else? No. Gratitude for you to come and be with us gratitude for those listening and those curious folk looking for lost stories <laughs> we just found a few <laughs> so laura thank you so much for um joining us today um and thank you to everyone for being here and we will have all of the links to all of those uh beautiful things laura shared i heard rudo finding them as we were recording so they will be there <laughs> <laughs> did you hear the <laughs> of the keyboard yeah. oh no <laughs> i should have muted sorry it's okay. <laughs> but yes do do stay tuned um dear listeners for more episodes on this topic and i mean all all the magic all the poetry that we have around myth fairy tales connection um join us continue to yes thank you both so much for having me Oh, yes. And uh, finally, yeah. And finally, um, the music you hear every time you play our podcast is called Whimsical Aliens, and it was written and performed by Alejandro Bernard from Ithaca, New York. Please subscribe and like his music tutorials on YouTube. They're so charming. You can become a Patreon to his work as well. This project is edited and produced by Bjorn, who works magic all the time on our episodes. Thank you so much. And we will see you next time. See you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye.